Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 14, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, uh, I think you'll see that immediately. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to rehash a bunch of things I did last week, rehash current market action, and then obviously look ahead a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up. Oh, it's a Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this. Endorsement of the PepsiCo. I'm too fat. Well, they said in so many different words, but uh, I got the idea. Red Bull, that is. I don't know if I said Red Bull. I tried to get an endorsement from Red Bull. I said I was too fat. And not an athlete. Hey, I walk three miles a day. That means something, right? All right. Enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book. You like the book. Otherwise, I don't know why the world you'd be here. Uh, throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon. The um, good reviews help to balance out the bad reviews. And I really don't have any bad reviews other than um, one or two that are obviously um, just somebody who's just malignant. <laughs> They're reviewing the reviews and saying that the reviews are too good. Oh, these reviews are too good. <laughs> oh, what a dumbass. All right. Um, enough of that nonsense, too. What do we talk about? Um, right now, I think we're in one of those most pain, most obvious and obvious type of things that I wrote about in this morning's column with the market. It seems like it wants to roll over, but what's it going to do? It's going to have a big rally first to... Um, Make everybody think the water's fine. And uh, then, of course, it's going to roll right back over. I want to continue on with the dead money report that we started last week, and we occasionally um, doing these things. That'll make more sense. Um, while I was working on an intro to trading series, which is on my website, I'll show you that in a few minutes, I got to thinking about how technical analysis or the methodology however you want to look at it, and psychology and money management are all kind of rolled together. And I often talk about it being like uh, three pillars of trading or, and then, or like a three-legged stool. And another way of looking at it is like a, like a rope with three strands. And we'll get to that, and it'll make a little sense. I um, want to get back to the IPOs a little bit. I do have an IPO webinar tomorrow, FYI, which I'll discuss again later. And thank to those who are on the... Uh, in the original webinar. First follow-up webinar is tomorrow. Anyway, let's just hop right into it. Um, dead money report for this week. Uh, I want to just rehash what we talked about a little bit last week. And there's a couple things I want to add to it. And again, a dead money is just slang term used for money invested in a security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. The point I'm trying to make here and drive home is that if you knew it would never amount to anything, then by all means, get out of the security, but you don't know. And we used an example last week of um, this uh, Zen, and I think if memory serves, it went from here to the initial profit target here, and it was about 113% annualized. So now it's 213% annualized because, as you can see, it's had a nice little run since then, and then you know, you can't be stupid and annualize that right there, a little five-day, because it would be like five million percent a year. But you get the idea. Even though you had to wait a little while, it's you still do a pretty good longer term by sticking it out with these positions. Now, I did want to go back in, and I didn't look at what I said last, uh, oh, I don't know, over the last few months. I know I've done a few of these. But uh, I wanted to just kind of start from scratch. And one thing that, again, and I try to drive this point home over and over again. And I was on a radio show this morning. I was on Benzinga this morning, and, and this came up too. It's like, don't try to outsmart the market. The market is the final arbiter. Let the market tell you what to do. And it's hard to, it's hard to release. It's hard to give that away. And a lot of us are used to having control, and a lot of us are probably control freaks. And and you can't. It's hard to become successful unless you are a bit of a of a controlling type 
of person because you have to control your destiny. You have to do certain things. But in the market, you do sometimes just the opposite. You have to let go. You know, like the song says, let it go, let it go, right? So don't try to outsmart the market. And how do you think I got the name Trend Following Moron? And the reason I got the name is because I was drawing my arrows in my column, and this was way back in the trading markets days, fairly early in the trading markets days when the market was going straight up. And at that point, I was writing about stocks, I was writing about commodities, I was writing about options, I was writing about everything. I was sort of like their go-to guy who wrote about all the markets. And that was kind of fun. It was grueling, but I tell you, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I was writing about one particular commodity market that was going straight up, and I kept predicting that it was going higher and higher. And I'm pretty sure that, although the person was anonymous, I'm pretty sure it was an individual who was short a lot of this commodity because they kept telling me how it was going down. And I, although I was impressed because this individual is uh, of, um, I don't want to say it, I'll give it away. Somebody I was very impressed with, to put you that way. And who achieve who achieve, has achieved a lot of success, and they were fighting the market, and I kept um, saying, "No, it's going up," and it kept going up, and I'm sure they were in a lot of pain from it. And I wasn't trying to pour salt in their wounds; I was just trying to show where the market was going, writing my column as I was doing. Anyway, uh, they got mad at me, and they called me a trend following moron. And to those who are new, who, newer to me, or never heard of that before. Um, the name stuck. Uh, we had T-shirts made, we had buttons made, um, <laughs> coffee cups. <laughs> so anyway, so that's where that came from. Um, let the market make the decisions for you. And it's amazing. I don't want to get too philosophical, but it's amazing how much pressure that takes off of you. You can sit and watch watch a screen all day, or assuming you're position trading, meaning that you're holding trades for days and weeks and hopefully months and years. And you can sit there and watch every little tick and drop F-bombs and feel good and, you know, go through all those up and downs. But I think you can only do that so often or so much, I should say, and eventually you're going to wear yourself out. Um, as I often preach, that's why I'm kind of anti-day trading is because you're forced to make too many decisions. And I I know a lot of day traders who have burnt out and have gone crazy. It's not for me to judge, but it seems like they've kind of gone crazy from the process. And I know a few that have dropped off the face of the earth. So it makes me wonder what happened to them. But we're just not wired to make that many decisions. And that's why I often say the air traffic, traffic controller and any other person that's in some high intense job, there's a high burnout rate. And, and the more decisions you're going to make, the more burnout you're going to get. Uh, but if you can let the market make those decisions for you, and sometimes it's just as simple as honoring your stop. Sometimes you might actually have to place that stop in the market and then forget about it. Um, you could do the same thing on entries too. Like if I'm looking at a position and I'm thinking that looks pretty good, instead of making a bunch of decisions and trying to front run it and figure out how can I get in as early as possible, what I'll do is I'll put a stop in, a stop market order, and if I get triggered, I get triggered. If I don't, I don't. So that's a simple little thing. So you don't have to make that extra decision. If you make a decision you want to get into position and the market opens and it doesn't trigger immediately, put a stop order in. Go about your business. Go have breakfast, okay, uh, or lunch, whatever the case may be. Keep in mind that getting back to the dead money before I digress too far, the market doesn't always adhere to your time frame, okay? Nor does it care. And I hate to personalize the market too much because that kind of makes you feel like it's it's your it's your enemy or whatever. But for lack of a better way of do, doing it, and there really isn't, the market doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about any of its participants. And it's a collective of participants. You can't get mad at the market. You can't get mad at the shenanigans and things that happen in the markets. You just have to learn how to embrace them. So the market doesn't care about you or your well-being. And keep in mind it's made up of a collective of 
people, and people do stupid things, and people are forced to do stupid things. So a lot of times people might exit a perfectly good position for reasons that have nothing to do with the company. Like I used to say, or I've said before, my friend Dick Fruth, um, his book is out. I, I read the draft long years ago, and it was really good, so I haven't read the final copy yet, but it's on Kindle. Uh, his last name, F-R-U-T-H, and he writes about the Phoenix type of stocks that I talk about. Uh, he calls them tombstones. But anyway, check that out if you get a chance, and I'll have to um, I have to read it and get a review up soon. But the point I'm trying to make about Dick is that he said he started his career many, many years ago where people would come in and hand him the shares of stocks. That's how old he is. And say, hey, uh, Dick, I want to sell these shares. And he's like, hey, okay, you know, sit down. We'll, uh, let's get them sold. And he'd, he'd ask him, why are you selling? Well, I'm getting a divorce. Uh, I'm buying a house. I'm buying a car. I'm getting a motorcycle. Um, rarely did anyone come in and say, well, the stock's going down. Or I've made a lot of money and I want to cash out. It, it, it's always a reason. Or there always seems to be a reason. So keep in mind the market is not out to get you, okay? It's just that stuff happens. And then maybe a hedge fund is getting called in on some shares for some reason or whatever. Maybe a hedge fund has to raise money. Um, maybe someone, hedge fund might be doing fantastic, but what if um, what if some people are cashing out for whatever reasons, for those aforementioned reasons, right, but in a, in a big way? Uh, or if they lose a big client or something, they're forced to raise capital. So that selling could cause a problem. It has nothing to do with the state of the market or anything, which kind of dovetails into the next point here. No one knows for sure what a market will do. I can make a lot more money in the educational side of my business if I acted like I knew something that no one else knows. Now, I'm not saying I don't know anything because after looking at markets all day long and doing this for 20-something years, I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen next. But I don't know for sure. And it's very hard sometimes to operate in such an environment, okay? It's like if you were a heart surgeon, you know, if you're a heart surgeon, you open up the heart, you know the heart's going to look a certain way. Uh, in general, but it's not like you would open it up and it's good, somebody's going to have three hearts or four hearts or one little one and one big one or whatever. You know, but the market is kind of like that. It's fluid, it's dynamic, and it changes, and you kind of have to learn how to adapt and change with it, okay? Um, outliers are important with the methodology, and in a few minutes I'm going to touch upon how the methodology, the money management, and the psychology all are intertwined. And getting your head wrapped around outliers can be tough. An outlier is a big move that statistically shouldn't happen, but it does, okay? And we embrace the outlier. We look to play that outlier. We look to get into that little solar stock that can go up 500% or onto some sort of fad or whatever, that could ha make this tremendous move or some company may be reinventing itself to, with a newer technology or using an older technology to do something new that could go up three and four and five hundred percent or whatever the case may be. That is not an inefficient type of market. That's a very inefficient type of market. That type of move statistically shouldn't happen, but it does. And we're there to position ourselves to catch such move, okay? So since outliers are important to the methodology, then you shouldn't do things that have the potential to eliminate them, Many, meaning that you shouldn't exit a position once you get in or 10 minutes after you get in or 10 days after you get in if you're not happy with the outcome, provided, of course, you're not stopped out in the position. If you're stopped out, you're stopped out, so be it. A little bit of discretion aside or stop Nick, et cetera, no big deal. But if you're genuinely stopped out of the position, then you're out of the position, but you have to embrace the methodology and know that those outliers are important. And if you micromanage yourself out of a trade that could turn into a great trade, then you're not going to do as well 
as you would. Change the title of the slide to a mindset of the trader or similar. <laughs> it extracted sessions to create an excellent short video for your website. Well, thank you, Leon. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I tend to go off on these uh, tants, uh, tants, tangents and rants. <laughs> Tangent, rangents. I tend to go off on rangents, rants and tangents. And I guess because I was thinking about the intertwined action of the money management and the psychology, I've kind of got off a little bit uh, on a tangent with the dead money on psychology. And it's true, though, but you can't eliminate the outliers if outliers are important. And embracing those outliers, knowing that's part of your methodology, that's key. And I'm going to back off a little bit of psychology here uh, until we get back on it in a few minutes when we get to the, um, the intertwined nature. Um, don't worry about missing opportunities. I should have put other opportunities here, okay? Don't worry about missing other opportunities. And that's one of the things that came up uh, a couple of weeks ago when we first started this. Somebody said, well, Dave, what if that position has caused me to miss opportunities? Well, lately we haven't had that many positions on, so you still should have some room in your portfolio. Now, just to dip back for a second into psychology, psych from a psychological standpoint, it should not affect you. You should just forget about it, and you should be looking at or looking for the next opportunity, and that should not taint your judgment. Like I said in my first book, I believe, under psychology, I was talking with a good friend, and we were, um, I wouldn't say trading buddies. We were both trading, and he was trading too. And I asked him how he was doing because he usually does fairly well. And he says, well, not so good. I'm, I'm, um, I'm nursing a bunch of bad positions. And it's like, well, what, is it, what does that mean? What is, what, that, that's stupid. That doesn't mean anything. It's like you're letting bad positions keep you out of good positions. If you're stopped out, you're stopped out. Now, you might have to do a little discretion here and there, but that's, that's something that takes a few minutes of your time. And it's not something that you should obsess over. And, and like I also said, I think in the first book on the psychology, it's like I went into the gym one day and I'm all excited. I know y'all laughing, me in the gym. Uh, but it's true. I, well, of course, my fighting weight, back then I was probably about 208 or 205. That's my fighting weight and uh, a solid 208. Um, and anyway, uh, I digress, but I went into the gym one day. I was kind of depressed, and the lady behind the counter was like, hey, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, I'm in a bunch of bad stuff. She's like, well, sell them and get a bunch of good ones. You know, it's like <laughs> she's right, you know, but sell them if you're stopped out and get a bunch of good ones. If they're not doing anything or not performing or if you think they're kind of dead money, don't worry about them. Just put your stops in. Leave your stops in. And, again, the pressure's off. Let the market take you out of those bad positions, if they are truly bad positions. Uh, and again, don't worry about other opportunities. If the market is not that great, which it hasn't been that great in a couple of months, you should still have plenty enough room for new opportunities. And if conditions are that great, then what's going to happen, as I say quite often, is that you're going to start taking partial profits in your existing positions, and that's going to free up some slots or some capital. And then also your margin is going to increase in your existing positions, and that should free up some capital, okay? And if those positions truly are stinkers, then you should get knocked out of them anyway, and that's going to free up some capital. So let everything unfold as it should. The point I was trying to drive home last week is that even though it seems like you're in something forever and it's not doing anything, if it does rally up to that profit target and beyond, that could be a pretty substantial move. And remember, that could be that elusive outlier that we're looking for, okay? It'll work without the outliers. We had a pretty good run earlier this year where the methodology was doing very well. We really didn't have any outliers. But having that one or two outliers can make all the difference in the world. And that's why... Uh, you know, this is this was a stop, Nick, in this position here. I get asked about this sometimes, but you can see this is this is one half of a position that's still on, 500% gain, roughly thirty thousand dollars. That's on a 100k portfolio. Okay, now the what kills, what pains me on this one is that it that it hit the stop. It didn't go a penny below it, but it technically it hit the stop, and that's what I call a stop, Nick, and that's why I do lessons occasionally on 
the importance of money management. But you could see, you catch one of those a year, you do pretty good. Now, the reason I want to show you this portfolio week over week is that obviously this Zen made a big move from where it was, where it closed last week to where it closed last night. So that certainly helps you out. That's about a 1.3% move in the entire portfolio. But also notice something that's kind of cool in here. Notice that this losing trade, yet another dead money trade that we've been in for a while, for a month or so, maybe even longer, is now a winning trade. It is now doing pretty well. Okay, and that's about a 1.4, 1.5% move in the entire portfolio. But Dave, what about that loss that got bigger? Well, you know, <laughs> it happens. What are you going to do? Okay, we did, we were short micron, and that we do have a little bit more of a loss there. But hey, I still think it's a viable position. So hopefully, a few weeks from now, I'll come in and show you how that would work on the dead money report. We did have a short, uh, one short in here, this rad which was last week's dead money report, part of it at least, where it didn't do anything and actually went against us for a substantial amount of time. And then it eventually panned out, which turned out to be, so far, knock on wood, ow, hurts my head, uh, a pretty good trade. So anyway, as you can see, at least now, it, it does pay to hang in there. Um, let me just touch upon the minor versus major bow ties real quick. I know some of, you, some of your eyes are going to glaze over. Um, but this is an important concept, and I get asked a lot about this. When you're trading a bow tie pattern, your best time to trade it or any other transitional pattern, let's say this is a major high in the market and this is a major low in the market, you want to be trading the shorts up here, and you want to be trading the longs down here. Okay, You're looking for a major change in trend where the most amount of people are going to be on the wrong side of the market. So just real quick, these are weekly sells. This was a sell. At 2000, a buy at 2003, a sell in 2007, believe it or not, or early, early 2008 at least. And then you had another major buy. When you have buys and sells in between, I call those minor buys and sells. It doesn't mean that the market can't rally or sell off from them, but your better signals are going to come off of major, major, and ideally all-time highs. And if you're trading... Uh, commodities or something, all-time lows, too. Hopefully, we'll never have to deal with an all-time low in the stock market. If if we do, I don't want to be, I don't know if we even want to be alive if that happens. Um, anyway, the reason I bring up major bow ties is when you get a bow, now that was weekly, so that's a really big deal if you get a weekly signal. This is a daily signal. I left in this chart from last week. And sometimes, especially after like a double top, and you get a bow tie. That second bow tie, or in this case, is actually the third bow tie. This one's kind of sloppy, but you can call it a bow tie. But sometimes that second or third time is a charm, and that's what's got me a little concerned about the Russell. really hasn't broken down from that just yet, and that's why I left in last week's chart. But it's still of somewhat concern. Okay. Any questions about anything covered so far? I'm doing an introductory series on technical analysis and it's actually it actually the genesis of it I should say was the introductory webinar I did on IPOs just to just to get everybody up to speed on my methodology with the IPOs we opened that um, webinar up I kind of have a, a grassroots kind of a word of mouth type of crowd and I've never really kind of opened things up larger than that other than I guess a few people who find me through the books. But anyway, I'm starting to do that a little bit. And in doing that, I, I realize that there are some people out there that may not know me from Adam. And it would probably be a good idea to do a little uh, introduction webinar. So we did a webinar for the IPO seminar. And what I started to do with this is break it into a series. And if you go to my website under education, is an intro to trading series right here. And the first one is up on YouTube now. And the reason I'm talking about this is when I got a little further into breaking this up in a series, and what I did was I started doing, uh, at first I just said, hey, here's the video, you know, and then I got to thinking, well, let me just talk a little bit more. Let me introduce it a little bit better, and let me do a little bit of uh, a post-mortem after each video. And in doing that, I really started thinking about the three pillars of trading, and that is psychology, the money management methodology, 
And if you've seen some of my presentations on that before, you'll know that I'll also use the analogy, although it's not as stately, I'll use the analogy of a three-legged stool and how without any one of those legs, the stool will fall over. Whereas I guess the the three pillars, <laughs> you know, maybe the maybe the the beam and whatever can kind of balance. Whereas on the stool, it'll obviously fall over. And then that got me thinking about how everything in trading, at least those three things, are intertwined. So if your methodology improves, then your chances of success will improve because that strand become stronger and that's pretty obvious and let's say your stock picking gets a little bit better and you're trading stocks that trade cleanly and have an acceleration of trend and you've got a a good looking setup okay and then maybe the sector matches it maybe the overall market is doing well too so you've done your homework it has no overhead resistance no bad memory, so to speak, of with that overhead resistance. So you've got a good looking setup. And if you have a repeatability in that and you begin to recognize these patterns over and over again and you're picking the best and leaving the rest, I know it's cliche, then obviously your methodology is going to improve and that's going to strengthen that strand and your chances of success are going to improve. But here's the epiphany that I had. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I'm just excited about this, and, and, and you guys let me know if it makes a lot of sense or not. But to me, I'm, I was thinking, not only does that success, that rope get stronger, the chance of success gets stronger when you improve on one of these, such as the methodology, but the other two strands have to improve, okay? Now, here's the point. Um, let's get back to the dead money thing. Let's say you decide that, okay, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this dead money thing anymore. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to do what needs to be done in the market. I'm going to forget about those positions that aren't working at the moment. And then guess what? A couple of those positions take off, okay? So in doing that, you become more confident in the methodology. So your psychology improves, okay, a little bit. Your success obviously goes up goes up okay but the psychology improves because next time you get into a position that's sort of a dead money type of position you're just gonna stick with it and although that one might not work out longer term sticking with the positions and catching more outliers are gonna make more sense so the more you know about the methodology the better your psychology is gonna be and your money management is gonna get better because you're gonna know how to manage that position. Now, for instance, let's say that you learn the methodology, you have the chance to be stopped out multiple times in a row. Well, that's going to help you to follow that money management plan, okay? And then psychologically, you're going to think, okay, I know I'm getting stopped out in here, but I'm not going to give up. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to throw caution to the wind. What it means is I know what that if I've gotten let's let me just rewind a little bit. Like Douglas says, I know if I've had three or four or you know, God forbid, even more trades in a row, and trust me, it will it'll happen. It has happened. It has happened this year. You know that the next few trades might be your big winners. So from a psychological standpoint, you know to take those. But you also know that you gotta stay in the game, but you're not gonna throw caution to the wind and you're still going to take the best of the best setup. So your mindset improves to where you're still going to take the best of the best, okay? And then you're going to have that money management plan in place just in case you're wrong. But as your psychology improves, following the methodology improves, and so does the money management. So the three are intertwined. And it makes life a lot easier if you could just focus on improving any one of these. And then life gets a lot better if you can focus on improving, obviously, all of these. But as soon as you get that, let's say you're struggling, as soon as you get that one little piece, you might be so close. You might be closer than you think. And as soon as you get that one little piece, 
as soon as you catch that one little outlier and you trail that stop and you don't micromanage yourself out of it and you stick with that one position for six months or a year that makes your whole year, you begin to get it. Okay, not that you just not that the methodology won't work without that one secret little position that's so hard to find, but when you do get that one outlier, then you totally get it. Okay, and then the money management. Getting back to money management for a second, let's say you do get stopped out a few times in a row, but it's only small losses. You can pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and live again. You know that you can lose on trades. Well, people, you're probably rolling your eyes. I was like, whoa, everybody knows that. It's like Pinocchio being the bad motivational speaker. You know, I see, I see potential in every one of you, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I digress. But getting stopped out and knowing you can lose money, when that bull run comes along and when you start knocking it out of the park and when you start getting winner after winner, and some of these turn into big winners, it doesn't go to your head. Because, hey, for the money management, you know, you can be stopped out. Stopped out. Psychology, that, see how they're intertwined? It, then all of a sudden, it's like your psychology gets a little better. Okay, I know these are some winners, but I'm not going to throw caution to the wind and put 100% of my account into the next position. A, a long-lost friend called me a couple days ago, and he told me what he did. He got incredibly lucky. As far as I'm concerned, and I don't want to, I don't want to beat him up too bad. Um, but if he does call back, I'm going to try to explain to him <laughs> how he got lucky. But he did everything he should have done. He sold all his. He he bought just ten stocks that he liked, which had nothing to do with technical analysis. And he sold them all, but one that was um, doing very well. Unfortunately, he dumped all the money from the other ten into the one stock, and. He got lucky, went up 300%, and he got out. So God bless him, and I'm glad he did well. I'm happy for him. He's got a rich, he's got enough um, in his retirement, I guess, to retire on now. Uh, but it was a very risky thing to do. He could easily lost all of it based on on what he was doing. So where am I going with that? I, I don't know. I forgot how I got there. Other than by having such incredible success, it may have gone to his head, and that's where, that's the weird part of, um, or the, I guess, it's like almost a perverse nature that, that occurs in the markets. It's like sometimes winning can actually hurt you in the markets. I had a friend, had been the key word in that sentence, he's no longer on this earth. But he turned, and if you've seen me speak in person, you may have heard me tell this antidote, but he turned $5,000 into roughly a million dollars. I saw it unfold. It was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen. Unfortunately, he round-tripped it because when he got to about three-quarters of a million dollars, he thought he was invincible, and he actually showed up homeless on my doorstep. And, of course, I let him in. Um, but you can't let it go to your head. And having the psychology to not let it go to your head by knowing the methodology, knowing there will be good times and bad times, and then knowing that if you keep your losses small and ride your winner. So it's like each little piece of the pie, or strand of the rope, I guess I should say. I shouldn't mix my metaphors. But each little piece helps the other two out. So if you are struggling, you may be closer than you think. And sometimes it's just a bad cycle in the markets, okay? Do I get bummed out? Yes. Do I question myself? Yes. Do I question my methodology? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Okay? We all get bummed out. We all get the blues, okay, driven by the market. I was called one of my trading buddies once and um he's like you sound bummed out it's like yeah the market went against me and it's like i don't i was like i don't know what's wrong with me but the market went against me today goes, stop right there that in and of itself is enough to to bum you out okay and we try not to let the market good or bad affect us but it does but the longer you do this 
the more your expectations will be tempered in good times, and then the more you realize in bad times that your next good trades might be just around the corner. So I've kind of digressed into a lot of different tangents and all when it comes to psychology, but we could spend days talking about the psychological aspects. But just know that if you could follow the methodology and keep that money management plan in place, your psychology is going to improve, which is going to help you follow the money manage, follow the methodology, and keep that money management place in place. And then you could you could go with either one of those. If you change your attitude, then your money management is going to get better, and then you're you're going to be easier to follow that methodology. Anyway, I think I kind of beat the dead horse. On <laughs> my Pinocchio voice is believable. Uh, lately, we've been talking about the last bull market in uh, IPOs, and I came out and said that that we're in an IPO bubble, but I meant it as a positive because bubbles tend to go much further and last much longer than people are willing to believe. A la 1999, the story I told just a few minutes ago, seems like an hour ago, on how I got named, uh, how I got labeled a trend following moron, you know, <laughs> because that bubble went a lot further than most people were willing to believe it. People were shorting it. People were fighting that trend. Not me, because I was a trend following moron, right? So I said that there's a bubble in the IPO market. Well, Druckenmiller came in like two days later and said the same thing, of course, right after my webinar. I said it as a positive, saying that, hey, let's ride this bubble. Okay. And so one have to one has to wonder if uh, we were the two pricks that popped this bubble in the IPO market. And uh, I, I guess I can't give myself credit. Uh, <laughs> that would be egotistical. But I'm, I'm sure Mr. Druckenmiller has a tiny bit more pull than I do out there. So has the bubble burst? To some extent, I think it has. And there are an increasing number of what I call a die and die pattern where these stocks come public and they just die. In fact, one of you guys, actually one of you girls, sent me an article on a company they brought public and it was such a fiasco that they actually they brought it public, then they took it private <laughs> like a week later. Okay. So it does happen. It and the euphoria has kind of died out a little bit. But keep in mind that there are fewer winners, but all you need is a few. And and here's the thing, euphoria hasn't completely died. We were looking at that crazy chicken company, Loco Polo Brothers Hermandes or what? Hermandes Polo Loco, whatever do we whatever it is, the uh chicken company. It went up a hundred percent, okay, in a few days. I mean I I guess they're selling meth, you know, because I can't imagine why a uh, chicken joint would go up so much. So there is some euphoria that's still left. Keep in mind that everything works when conditions are great. The old market adage, don't confuse brains with the bull market. And every now and then, present company included, we kind of got to tap the brakes and realize, well, wait a minute, maybe it's not my big, smart, gigantic brain that is 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 making is just brilliant and making this money. Maybe I'm in the conditions are good, and that's why we're doing well. Okay. Um. And the thing is, you just have to work a little harder when conditions aren't great. It's so weird. It's like when I'm printing money, you're probably thinking this guy must work his butt off. And it's like, well, shoot, <laughs> thirty minutes after the close, after I start scanning. Sometimes 30 minutes before the close, I start scanning. I know I have a pretty good idea what I'm going to do the next day. Yeah, I'll finish my other analysis, which does take a while. But in general, yeah, 30, 40 minutes, I probably know what I'm going to do. On when conditions are choppy and going sideways, I might spend two hours and then realize, hey, I'm not going to do anything. Okay? So you have to work a little harder when conditions aren't great. Okay? And sometimes all that work, you end up with nothing. And that can be a little frustrating. But if you know that, again, coming back to the methodology and the money management and the psychology, if you know that there are times where things aren't going to work out, it helps you to be patient longer term. Okay. So, again, you have to work a little harder. Um, there's been a few more die-and-die die type of uh, IPOs lately. 
I'm not going to beat the dead horse on this uh, slide, but basically with a die and die, the enthusiasm hits and it's at its highest, and then that enthusiasm begins to wane. The reality of the stock is qu quickly realized. Like somebody pointed out, it might have been um, my brethren, Mr. Druckenmiller, that um, the majority of some, he had, he quoted some statistic of these IPOs never made any money. It's like, well, so what? Who cares? It's like, that's true. We're not, we're not going to live with this IPO. We're just going to try to trade it and make some money. Well, that reality in these, the reality being failure to materialize, okay, that sets it really quick. And I'm guessing everybody knows the sardine story by now, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, so again, there's the increasing number of dies. Here's one, I think from, this is a recent one, and notice it came public up here, and it's died. So what do you do? Well, just don't buy them. Here's another one. You know, it came public and so far it's died. So that's where the old Will Rogers adage comes in. Buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Here's another one, okay, straight down. So what? You just avoid it. Okay. Uh, let me just touch upon this real quick. It seems like the market flattens out. It seems like IPO market flattens out. The market begins to sell off a little bit. All of a sudden, you get this pop in IPOs. And it seems like this flatness to sell off or sideways market we've seen kind of coincided with the bubble we had in IPOs. And this is kind of a typical cycle. And then sometimes when the market does begin to roll over, you get that last gasp in IPOs. People... People don't want to buy a brick-and-mortar kind of company with earnings that could be qualified, et cetera, that efficient company out there, that big, thick stock. But they might be willing to fritter away a little bit of money into something that's exciting. And, ooh, a 3D printing company or a biotechnology, a little solar company. Ooh, it's a, you know, ooh, that chicken is so good. You know, maybe buy a chicken company or something. Okay. And then... Again, like I said earlier, when conditions worsen, nothing works, okay? When conditions are good, everything works. When conditions worsen, nothing works. But then there's also that little time in between I've found from empirical research, just watching things happen in the IPO market, where you do have a little bit of that last little gasp in that little bubble that happens. Um, there's still a few winners in one, two, or a few is all you really need. Again, getting back to Zen. Zen finally took off. That was, by the way, an IPO. Um, so if it keeps on keeping on, hopefully, and I had to use the word hope, but hopefully next year around this time we're talking about this stock and it's up four or five hundred percent. Now, I don't wanna I don't want to be a bummer. I just I'd like to just talk about the positive. But there is a negative side, obviously, the IPOs, because a lot of times they do have deep corrections, okay, before they take off again. So we might be due for a correction in this one, but I don't know, okay? I don't know. So what are we going to do? We're going to trail that stop higher, and hopefully the correction isn't too bad, and we're able to ride that out. Baba, uh, Alibaba in September. Yeah, that's going to be probably one of the most anticipated IPOs since, um, I guess, Facebook. Baba is some, uh, what do they do, Chinese something? Is it like Chinese Amazon? How would you make that two word? China's Amazon and a Chinese. Chinese Yahoo. Oh, Chinese Yahoo. Oh, I thought it was Chinese Amazon. Okay. So it's going to be like a Chinese Yahoo, Chinese Chinese Google, Googleese, Googleese. Um, so should we buy it? I don't know. Let's see what it does. If it goes up, we will. What if it goes down? We're not going to buy it. Sometimes it is that simple. The other thing, too, again, you know, getting back to the IPOs, yeah, Chinese, Chinese Amazon, okay, that's what I thought it was. Um, even if this IPO bubble has burst and if it's over with, uh, as I said, remember the tree thing, and that's, that's one thing I said just in case, just to cover my buttocks, <laughs> because I'm like, guys, we're in a bubble. Let's make some money in this bubble. But just in case this bubble bursts, keep in mind there will be companies that come public that will be worth trading, even if the bubble bursts. And think about it. Every stock that's trading now was once an IPO. Write that down. Put that in the back of your head, okay? 
So there's a chance that one of these stocks, whether it be Zen or the chicken company, <laughs> has the potential to be the next big thing, even if the bubble bursts to where they're not all going up like it seemed like they were not that long ago. And then but the tree thing is that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and then second best time is today. And I'm I'm looking at I'm literally looking out uh, across the pond, across the street, to my neighbor's house. Fifteen years ago, tried to sell a house. Agent said, "Nope, you don't have enough trees." And he planted a bunch of little trees. And I'm like, well, "Stupid, you know? <laughs> like that's like the like the the prospective buyers that come walking up, like, oh, look at all these trees that are one inch high.' And then, well, it's fifteen years, and these things are about a hundred feet high now. Uh, and I can't even see his house anymore, and he just put his house back on sale, and he's actually sold it. They probably came over and said, wow, look at all these beautiful trees. <laughs> so the analogy is that there will be IPOs in the future that are worthwhile. There will be companies worth buying in the future that are worthwhile because they are going up or they will be going up. Um, well, I guess you've got to buy them as they're going up. You know how it works. Anyway. But uh, the best time to plant a tree 15 years ago, second best time is today. So get get up to speed on those guys. Um, speaking of IPOs, the first follow-up webinar is tomorrow. I will make an effort to get the word out as much as I can. But to those of you who went to the first webinar, just periodically, and I won't, I, I'll give you at least a week's notice, and as I, it's been up there for over a week now. I will announce them on that IPO page when the next webinar will be. Well, the first one's going to be tomorrow, and there's going to be three more after that. I want to spread them out a little bit, just like I waited about a month to do this one, because I wanted to see how the market shape shook out. And unfortunately, it wasn't as great as I wanted it, but there were enough winners to still make it worthwhile, and I think it's going to be cool. And sometimes, sometimes you learn from the bad more than you learn from the good. If everything went up, then everybody would think, wow, this is great, greatest thing to slice bread, and then it could actually do more harm than good. Like I always say, the people who come in, in like my core methodology, during bad times and tough it out, they're my best clients, and they're the clients that I've had for 10 years. The people who come in during good times, they're, they tend to be more of a flash in the pan, and they go off to chase rainbows. All right, uh, let's get ready. Let's hop out to the overall markets. Uh, FYI, Store is now open on my site. Someone said, without being a dead horse on this, someone said, Dave, you got good stuff, but it's impossible to find. Why do you hide it? Like he says, it's almost like you're hiding something. Why are you hiding everything? And I'm like, I'm not purposely trying to do it, but that's just how it worked out. Anyway, you like these uh, webinars? I have volume one done, and I started writing everything on here that I covered. And it sort of amazed me. I started to fill up the page. Then I actually extended the page out. This was the edge of the page here and over here. And then I actually extended the page out because I had so much stuff to put on here. But anyway, we covered a lot of ground so far this year. Psychology, money management, of course. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the rest of this stuff. Um, the only thing to highlight just real quick is that if you do get this, right now I'm, I'm giving everything away for free with the purchase of stock selection webinar. A year of my service, plus the IPO webinar, plus any follow-up webinars that go with the IPO thing. So anyway, all right, uh, let's go ahead. Let me talk about the market for a few minutes, and we'll open up for individual stocks. You can start asking about those stocks now. And anything that we covered uh, so far, or anything else for that matter, feel free to ask about. And let's go ahead and jump into the overall uh, market. Let's take a look at some of these um, sectors first. The one thing that I've noticed is that the amount of stocks that have bow tied down lately and and the more importantly the amount of sectors that have bow tied down. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the piece first and let's get before I get too far ahead of myself, let me show you what's going on. In the S and P's, notice that we made a bow tie. And that means a 10 simple has crossed below the 20 and the 30 exponential. The 20 has crossed below the 30, okay? And so the 10 is greater than the 20, is greater than the 30, 
And then over a short period of time, that relationship flips to where the 10 is less than the 20, and the 20 is less than the 30, okay? Pretty simple moving average crossover stuff, except that I'm using three moving averages. And I'm also looking for a fulcrum point. When that happens over a short, short period of time, it suggests that the shorter term and the longer term cycles have changed, okay? And that the market, especially if you're coming off of an all-time high, as I often tell people, you know, people say, hey, Dave, you trade Forex? Yeah, I do, but I don't really talk about it much because it's a very efficient market and you don't have that many opportunities. In fact, I actually, I actually, in order to avoid getting charged a fee for an inactive account, I actually will occasionally, don't gasp, I'll occasionally go in and do a day trade just to keep the account active. So I'd rather be, I'd rather make a day trade and have the potential to make some money than be charged a fee, and that's, that's just money you lose. So I'd rather risk a little money than lose it, okay? Um, but the point I'm trying to make is if you only trade off of major transitions in any market, it doesn't have to be Forex, I think you'll do fairly well. You also sit on your hands a lot. Now, sitting on your hands is not a bad thing, okay? And that's another thing that takes a while to learn is that sometimes, as I often preach, the waiting is the hardest part. Okay, let's look at these P's. We've crossed over the moving averages, and now it looked like it was off to the races. It looked like the market was going to sell off, but then it reversed, came back up. And now it's kind of crawling its way back higher. Let's uh, clean this chart up real quick. Uh, it looks like the market wants to come up and challenge this overhead supply in here. And we're kind of getting there. So anyone who bought in, in this range might be looking to get out of break even. That's just human nature. So that's going to be the resistance for the P's. Probably around, let's just see what, around what that is. That's around 1960, round numbers. Let's just call it 1960. It makes it easy to remember, right? Oops. Okay, so that's the P's. P's look a little ominous. Now you got the NASDAQ. NASDAQ, when you look at the P's, you would think the NASDAQ's going to look like heck, right? But the NASDAQ is just kind of stuck in a range, and it's actually kind of working its way back up to the top of that range. And keep in mind, the top of this range is 14-year highs, the highest level since 2000 when it peaked out on March 9th when my little one was born. Okay, absolute high of the market that day. So we haven't seen those highs since, but if we could crawl up about another percent in here, thereabouts, maybe in change, we'll be back to those 14-year highs, okay? So NASDAQ looking a little bit better, but then you get back to the rusty, and the rusty remains the rub. So far, you've got that thrust down, and then you've got that bow tie we talked about a few minutes ago. And so far, it just appears to be pulling back, okay? So rusty's still looking pretty ugly in here. People always say, Dave, what would it take for you to be bullish? Well, I'd like to see the NASDAQ make new highs, I like to see the S&P make new highs, and ideally, I like to see the Russell make two highs, new highs. And so, so you're bearish. It's like, well, I'm not bearish. I'm just concerned. And I think when you label yourself a bull or a bear, it makes it a lot harder to see both sides of the market. Just like in the Benzinga interview this morning, they were asking me about shorting, and I'm like, eh, it's a necessary evil, as we've discussed in here time and time again. Every time the market appears to be rolling over, in fact. Because it helps, not that you're going to get rich on the short side, but if you do end up with a market like 2008, obviously at least you'll make some money. But the beauty of it is it helps you to see both sides of the market and helps to temper your expectation. So be careful about labeling yourself a bull or a bear and do look for clues, like I said last night in the service, look for clues that are both good and bad, okay? So... Um, is it Frankenstein or Tarzan talks with one word syllables? I forget, you know, because it's. I remember we took the Rosetta Stone. I did like a Rosetta Stone thing, 
<laughs> first time I went to Italy, and you talk like uh, Tarzan, you know, good, bad, a tree. <laughs> it's like yeah, one word sentences. But anyway, uh, you have to look for good, and you have to look for bad, just like uh, uh, you know, S&P, bad, NASDAQ, good, sort of good, right? So you have to see both sides of the market. Now, one thing that I am seeing, if you look at – a lot of these sectors, in fact, I think i got a few more in here in a different list. That's fine. There it is right there. If you look at a lot of these sectors, at least these major sectors, aerospace, defense, automotive, banking, chemicals, energies, uh, if I could find them, there they are. No, that's semis. Semis, there's the energies. You can see that a lot of these areas look like, look like they're rolling over in here and have bow tied down off of major, major highs. And some of them, like materials of construction, are now in bona fide downtrends. You can see you had your you had your first thrust back here, then you had your bow tie. I mean, go back to the rusty, right? What do you have there? Well, you had your first thrust here, and then you had your bow tie, okay? So this is now a secondary signal. You have those pioneer signals, which are the first signals you get, the emerging trend signals, which I call pioneer signals, but now we're actually getting secondary signals. It's um of these markets, media bow tie down, materials construction, like I just said, manufacturing foods, of course, telecom, okay? What's interesting about telecom is it made this major catch up to the overall market, okay? It was doing pretty good in here, making new highs, and then it began to implode, and now it's pulled back, and it's bow tying too. Let me just throw a 50-day moving average in there. I was on uh, Market Toolbox with um, Doug um, Newberry and uh, Bill McKinley. They, those guys will have me on every now and then. We have a lot of fun. Um, anyway, we often talk about the 50-day moving average. And one thing I've noticed is that it didn't really work out with this here. Let me see if it's in the piece. It's one of these indices we're looking at. Maybe the Russell. Um, sometimes when you get that moving average crossing over sharply, on the 50-day moving average, I'm sorry, the bow ties, it could be a fairly powerful signal. I'm wondering what market we're looking at. Anyway, so keep an eye out for that. I don't know which market it was. Maybe the, well, it wasn't that one. But the point is, when this moving average is crossed sharply against the 50, and when that 50 is a little higher up, sometimes those could be pretty uh, powerful signals. And I'll have to find what market we're looking at for next week. But anyway, just write that down. Keep that in the back of your mind. So overall market look, looking pretty good as far as the NASDAQ is concerned. S&Ps look questionable. Russell looking questionable. So you got one out of three. NASDAQ looks okay. The rest of the indices looking questionable. And most sectors look questionable at best. So you're going to be, uh, it's young Frankenstein? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, uh, he's kind of a, my brother-in-law's father-in-law had chest pains uh, on a on a like a Sunday, and finally on Monday he got around to going to the doctor. And the doctor says, "You know, you look, you seem to be healthy as a horse. You seem to be fine. You're not dying of a heart attack. The only thing I can think of is that maybe some muscles in your chest got pulled at, at uh, some ligaments or something, and and that can be." He goes, "Well." He said, did you do any hard work? No. And he, he went through all the list of things, and he finally says, uh, he goes, did you have, like, a laughing fit or something? And he says, yes, I saw young Frankenstein over the weekend. So, anyway, I digress. All right, I think that's enough for the sectors. You get the picture, okay, for the most part, looking a little questionable in there. Let's go ahead and hop into the uh, stocks. Uh, John, we're not going to cover that one, but I like it. Um do me a favor, email me off, offline on that one. That's one I'm actually going after today, and it is a, it's one of those, uh, I'll, I'll give everybody a tease, it's one of those IPOs, and I think it's a, I think it's it's definitely worthwhile, and it could actually trigger, uh, believe it or not, on the close today, okay? Uh, James wants to know about IFF as a short. Guess who's here? Guess what he wants to know about? <laughs> Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. A little bit uh, on the thin side for as far as shorts are concerned, uh, 400,000 shares. You could probably find shares. Um, I'll tell you what I do like about it and why I'm almost going to give you a high five. 
I don't like this bar here that much. I don't like the way it kind of shot down and went right back up. But it looks okay. Okay. And you know what? I'll give you a high five on it. And I've seen this one out there. I don't know if I put it on any official list because it's a little bit thinner, so I'd be careful of that. I like the overhead supply, and I like the fact that it's crawling back up to the overhead supply. The only thing I don't like, and I guess the overall market is kind of doing this too, but usually when you have a transitional pattern, since we have a little time, let me just throw something in here, throw a little quick lesson in. Usually with a transitional pattern, my favorite patterns occur when this happens. When you have a market, and of course, or again, the new highs thing, the, high, the higher the higher, the better, okay? Because that means the most amount of people are on the wrong side of the market when it does begin to turn. But ideally, what I like to see, let's just use like a first thrust as an example. I like to see that tiny little, little pullback. Now, keep in mind, with that tiny little pullback, you're not getting that big, nice reversion to the, to, to the mean swing like you would if you were playing a deep pullback, you know, you're getting that pop all the way back to the prior highs, okay? And if that happens, then that might be enough to take profits in and of itself. In this particular case, there's not much reversion to the mean, so forget about that. But the beauty is, if you only have a little rally, and like day two, it, it hits like that, well, everybody and their brother who was looking to get off the hook, waiting for this market to just crawl its way back to its old highs and beyond, is now forced to make a decision, and they may be forced out, and their selling may help to exacerbate your short position. Last time I used that word, they said, hey, this is a PG-13 show. Watch what you say. But uh, anyway, it should help things out. Okay, it's a word. Look it up. Uh, <laughs> it, here's the lesson here. This, this is psychology 101, rearing its ugly head. Everything I do or 99.9%, .9%, I should say, what I do. There, there might be something out there that's a little bit on the fringe. But I'd say 99.9% .9 of what I do, I can show you that there is a huge psychological basis to it and what's happening. And in this particular case, instead of waiting for that, watch, it keeps pulling back. seems like your best shorts had the tiniest of rallies and then implode, okay? But it's still a viable setup. It's just an ideal setup. Like at this first little update here, if it had triggered then and then imploded, then all of a sudden you got this whole gang back here that's in trouble and everybody else who has bought or held since in trouble looking to get off the hook. Okay. But uh, high five. I'll give you a high five on that one, James. So, Dave, I noticed that you give more high fives out to people who are in your service. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, that's probably true. But they're smarter. They're smarter because... They, not because of what I'm a service, because they, they're they taking control of their destiny by learning how to trade. And they've got, they've got me to bounce things off of. Uh, Twitter. Um, Twitter's a big, thick stock, and I don't like its wide and loose nature. I don't like the way it gaps around the way it does. But I hear you, gap tire, and it came right back in. It looks, looks, looks like it's trying to rally. Um, I would leave it alone. I think it's just kind of too crazy to trade. But if I had to trade it, I, I, I can't say put a gun to my head because my wife gets mad when I say that. I guess if I was at a, especially in this business, right? Um, if I had to make an opinion, I'd say, yeah, it looks like it's headed higher. Uh, I just don't like stocks after they make huge gaps up. A lot of times you get a huge gap up, and then the market comes all the way back in. I would just, I would avoid it. I don't think it's worth the risk. Okay, Don's here, and he wants to know about what would Don want to know about some effing stock. Well, Don, that one looks like it's in trouble again. Okay, because it's approached. Now, keep in mind, it's a big, thick stock. It's wide and loose. It's not something that I want to rush out and trade today or tomorrow. But you did make these marginal new highs in here, multi-year highs. So if you get a transitional pattern from that, then you probably need to pay attention to it. So let's see what we got. We got, we definitely have, we don't got, we have. It's a good thing my wife corrects my English. 
we definitely have a no, not quite a bow tie, believe it or not. That's kind of odd. It looks like a first thrust down. Uh, for me to want to buy Ford, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. But uh, leave that alone for now, unless you want to look to short it. James wants to know about AAL. AAL. Um, yeah, and this is you got to get into the high five for me, James. James is on the service, but that's not why he's going to get a high five. Here's a stock makes all-time highs. Let's just confirm that with a monthly chart. Close enough for government government work, okay? Almost all-time highs. 10-year highs, 15-year highs. Um, economy enters around there, building this kind of a base. Begins to implode. Right as it implodes, notice that a bow tie. So it's actually triggered on a bow tie already and pull them back a little bit. Now, it has a tiny bit of a witch hat look to it, a high-level witch hat, okay? And somebody asked me about that. I have to – might have been you, James, or someone. Let me explain the witch hat. Keep in mind, the witch hat is with the trend, okay? But, yeah, I like that a lot. You know, maybe an entry about 37 or so would be a good place for that. Somebody was asking me about witch hats. And keep in mind that, for the most part, I really only trade witch hats on the short side. It's one of those patterns that really lends itself well to the short side more than the long side. So let's see if we can get to this uh, blank screen. Come on. Okay. Um, keep in mind, again, that the witch hat is a with the trend pattern. Okay. Meaning that you want a witch hat to look like this and you have like the little blip or whatever. Mark comes up and stalls out right at that prior little peak. So it looks like an upside down which is that. How can we draw an upside down which? Okay. So you want to see that retrace and then then this is where you get that possible reversion to the mean move back to the direction of the trend. Two thousand and eight, we had a lot of witch hats. The market would sell off, sharp retrace, sell off, sharp retrace, and then sell off again. Okay. And then you have these witch hats, which would be right here. Okay, so it is starting to look like a high-level witch hat, meaning that the market rolled over, and you got your first thrust setting up, and you got your bow tie setting up, and it kind of rolled over. Now it's making that second little retrace, so now it has a bit of a high-level witch hat look to it, which is a good pattern, which is fine, because that because now you get the reversion to the mean move too. So let's uh. Dave, what's reversion to the mean? Well, if you know someone who's mean and they're nice to you for a few days, they're, they're likely to go back to uh, being mean. What did Jimmy Buffett write once? They're born that way and they will be that way for life. <laughs> write that down. That's good information. Um, but, yeah, nice bow tie down. Your bow tie triggered. Your first those triggered. And then now you're getting a secondary signal, but that looks pretty good still. In fact, is Phil in here. Because Phil, you know what Phil likes to trade. We talk about Phil every now and then. He likes to trade throwbacks to the 50. So let's throw the 50 in there. Uh, he likes to wait for the 50 to get busted and then have a throwback up to it. Oh, by the way, thanks a lot, James. That's the, uh, no, I said it kind of flippantly. I mean, no, seriously, thanks a lot. Uh, this is the bow tie into the 50 pattern I was talking about earlier. Okay. There's your 50-day moving average, simple moving average, and then, bam, you get a bow tie right through it on a sharp angle. Sometimes that could be a powerful signal. Uh, this is also my famous airlines pattern. My famous major errors pattern is wait until the airlines rally and then short them. Okay? Write that one down too, by the way. But, yeah, you got a bit of a witch hat look to it, maybe around 37. Uh, that looks pretty darn good. Could have a little support back here, but that will get blown through pretty quickly uh, just by waiting for an entry. Okay? But, yeah, this stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble, so I have to agree with you on that one. Wynn wants to know about TTO. -O. Okay. Um, this one is on my radar. It is a, an IPO. And let's see, one, two, three, four. I think this is one that I'm actually uh, closely watching. Um, it looks pretty good. It um, it's It's a little thin. You know, let's see if we got any good days in here. 200, 300. Yeah, it's gotten pretty thin pretty quick, so you got to be super careful. But depending on where it closes today, it could uh, it could actually um, could actually work out, kind of like that ears. Okay, 
Wynn also wants to know about rice. Uh, okay. We were long rice earlier this year. Remember we talked about the IPO bubble? <coughs> it made a nice little run, but then it came all the way back in. I would leave it alone now because you've got bad memories here. And that's just kind of in the middle of the range. So I would leave that one alone. A, uh, Alan is very excited about ARWR. Let's check that out. ARWR. Uh, no. Uh, it's sort of bottoming out. I mean, I hear you. But it's stuck at a range. So there's nothing to do there. Uh, if you're going to trade a transitional pattern, because this looks like the last trend was a downtrend and now we're in a sideways trend. This is where you want to be getting in a transitional pattern, okay, at major, major lows. And if you're shorting it, you want to come off of major highs. Not that I would recommend you short a wild and crazy biotech stock, but if you were going to short, that's where I would do it. Uh, it's just sideways. I would leave that alone. There's nothing for me to get excited about that. Even if it broke out of this range, I wouldn't get excited about it. It would have to break out to do highs before um, I did anything. I think we traded this stock before because look at the – I've got the chart all marked up. I think this was a good – this was one of the bigger winners that I remember. I, I think so. Maybe I'm losing it. Cop is a short. Well, cops are really thick, but sometimes on the short side, it's okay to short these thick stocks. Uh, yeah, I'll give you an okay on that. I hope that wasn't James. Oh, <laughs> it is. All right, James. You get another high five. Kind of made this flat top in here. Kind of sold off a little bit. Now it's creeping higher. Here's the beauty of this stock, okay? Short it not too far from where it is now. Where do you put your stop? Up here, okay? This, this is one thing that's great about if you're trading a transitional pattern. If you're trading a transitional pattern, meaning an emerging trend, and it's occurring not too far from the prior highs and you're shorting it if it goes back up and makes new highs then you are wrong you know you are wrong so that's the beauty of that now let's say you're in a pullback pattern and You get your little entry like a good little boy or girl. You're doing what you're supposed to. Stock pulls back and then begins to rally. So you get your little entry wherever. Let's say it begins to sell off. Well, there's a big question mark because you never know if it is going to keep pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, okay, and then turn into a bona fide downtrend. Or is that pullback going to stop and then the market takes off again, okay? But if you're trading a transitional pattern and you short right here somewhere, you know as a trend follower, as you're supposed to be, that if it goes on to make new highs, then you are wrong. So that's the beauty sometimes about these pioneer patterns is you have a defined point where you're wrong. And I know it sounds like I'm focusing on negative, but it's kind of cool because you know, hey, I was wrong. It's one thing to be wrong and then – Watch the market turn around and go be right, <laughs> if that makes any sense, okay? Let's say you, you get knocked out of a pullback, and it's like, well, that's fine. I'm following the rules, like Dave says. You know, my psychology is going to get better. My money manager is going to get better. Uh, you know, I see potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm going to do great. And then you watch that market go straight back up. Well, that just, pardon my French, pisses you off. But at least with some of these transitional patterns, even though your chances of being right are a little bit less than the generic trend-following pattern, the great news is you know exactly where you are wrong, and if you're wrong, you're wrong. You get off, you get out, and you move on. You know, get off the position, get out the position. How you want to look at it, and you move on, and so you're wrong. So what? And that's the beauty of uh, some of these early trend or emerging trend patterns, I should say. Okay, Jonathan wants to know about A G T C, A G T C. Okay. Uh, no, it's another case where this is one of those um, that's in the middle of uh, the the range type of thing. It, it took off, and that was nice, but then it's come all the way back in again. So I'm not really interested in trading the stock at this juncture because now it's sort of established a, 
a, a big peak and a big bottom. And it's just, it, for me, it's not worth trading. You probably got some bad memories in this stock now, especially since an IPO. Anybody who bought it this high and wrote it down is probably looking to get out of break even. So I'd leave it alone. Okay. Do you draw fibs off that AAL chart? Eh. You know, even when I draw fibs, I'm looking at uh, deep retracements. I'm not necessarily looking at the um, the Fibonacci number per se, okay? Uh, but I do occasionally use some Fibonacci. If I, you know, um, I guess I have to come out the closet and meet it and, and, and mention that. But in this particular case, it's really in deep enough to be a meaningful Fibonacci. I guess if it got to about 40, it would. And that would sort of complete the witch hat around 40. So, yeah, if you want to look at that from a fib standpoint, that's fine. I tend to eyeball, even when I do the gatekeeper, I tend to eyeball the Fibonacci um, patterns. It's kind of like I'm a closet fib guy, I guess. I, I, I go both ways on it. The problem is, and I discussed this in the IPO webinar, and I'm wondering if I got, I'm wondering how hard it would be to bring that chart up. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Because I, I do have an IPO. pattern that uses a a sort of a Fibonacci type of deal. Let's see if we can find it. No, I can't find it on the fly. Anyway, I threw up a chart with about a thousand lines in it. And that's one of my problems with the Fib people is um, sometimes there's always a pattern and, and there's not always a pattern. Okay. DEJ, Andre, DEJ, DEJ. No, you kidding me? Well, it's it's chew, it's a penny stock, okay. Now I'll trade something over a buck a share. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's penny stock. It's all over the place, and you just got a tremendous amount of overhead supply. So I'd be really careful with that. Um, that's kind of dangerous. Too dangerous to, to trade. If it got its act together, it got above this resistance in here, uh, then maybe, but I'd leave it alone. Okay. Richard wants to know about GCI. GCI. Okay. Now, media stocks are, are, have been headed lower as of late. Uh, maybe a little bit deeper pullback. The problem is a deeper pullback is going to put you into the prior pullback. So the pullback's kind of shallow in here. It just had this one day higher, and then that was kind of the whole trend, and then it shot up and it came back in. It's not jumping out at me as a pullback that I'd want to play. And then you gotta you got to um, frame that within the fact that the market's a little questionable right now, and media overall is a little questionable. Let's, let's jump to the industry. Uh... Okay, and then, oh, look, somebody drew a little arrow in here. i got to change my arrows back to blue because I, I keep calling them blue arrows. Look at that. So you got a little you got a little bow tie working there. you got a little down arrow. Okay, you, you almost have the little witch hat pattern we just talked about beginning to happen. So I would have to really, 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 really like that uh, that stock, Miss Lewinsky, uh, GSI. <laughs> Um, to get excited. The other thing, too, that's kind of jumping out of me now is that, like I said, you had that one bar up, and then let's put the net net moving there. It's going about 1.5% uh, over the last few days. It depends on it's actually flat going back a couple of days. So that looks like a stock that has lost some momentum. Okay, so I would leave it alone based on that. Okay, Howard says CV, CLVS just crossed 50 and about the bow tie across the gap from a year ago. Started to buy with a stop rising at 20 EMA. Started to buy CVLS, CLVS. Howard likes that 20 EMA. And I used to be a huge fan of it too. I'm just learning to do a lot of other stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, this was just wide and loose longer term. That's my only problem with it. And anywhere from, let's say, 50 or above, it's going to have a hard time getting through all that mess, okay? Um, I hear you. I see, your, I see your little moving averages coming together, okay? And it's going to make that little pattern I talked about where it 
it splashes the 50. Um, if in and of itself, if all I had was that in and of itself, what am I doing wrong here? Then by all means, it might be worthwhile. I got a window open somewhere. I got to find it. Let's see. There we go. I mean, if I was just seeing this, okay, I'd say, oh, look at the moving averages coming together. It looks like it bottomed out. But it's got too many bad memories and it's all over the place. So I would avoid it based on that. Okay. Uh, HQY is an IPO, but I'll talk about it. HQY. Um, I'm going to say let it go, but it does have that, that buy at B characteristic to it we talked about before where, um, you know, and that's the beauty of technical analysis is that sometimes, well, not sometimes, but if a market, let's say a market's at 5 and let's say it's going to 20 and let's say 10's in between, well, it's got to pass through 10. This is A, this is B, and this is C. Okay. Um, it's you can't just buy at B or can you is what I was hinting at in the IPOs. Um, and in some cases you can and do really well. And if you don't do well, so what? The one or two that 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 you make a hundred or two hundred percent on are going to pay for those other ones and then some. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a buy at B type of situation. Um, the problem with it is, without giving away too much, is I'm not as big a fan of these. Uh, the buy at B would have been long from about three points ago, but I'm not a big fan of the stocks, the, the IPOs that come public above 20 for these pioneer kind of setups. These pioneer setups are buy at B where you're buying very early in a cycle, only after five days worth of trading. And I'm, I'd much rather a stock that's at lower levels that when that pattern occurs as opposed to these stocks that come public above $20 a share. Now, that $20 might might move. So I would wait for the first pullback here and then uh, see what's going on. Hey, Doc, good to see you. Doc wants to know about NEM. Um, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, it should work. Uh, boy, I hate to say it should, but, uh, yeah, it looks good. You know, what's frustrating about goal is that we um, – it looked like it was making the mother all bottom in these gold stocks, and then what happened is that the gold stocks rolled back over again. And last time that happened, the good thing was at least we got a piece out of it. Uh, this time it didn't work. And then, of course, what are they doing? They're coming right back. So – Gold could be hard to tr to trade. I have a love hate relationship with it, as Doug says. I love it, and it hates my account. But the gold stocks made a major low in early '14. We traded A and V. We made a little bit of money, and then it came right back in. So that's what NEM. I'm sorry. Right now, it's like it looks like they're trying. They they triggered in again. Then they just chopped around and rolled back over. Now they're trying to take off again. Let's see. Was it A and V that we went after again? It was one of these that's really frustrating in that it looked like the mother of all bottoms and it rolled right back over. I forget which gold stock it was. But NEM looks pretty good. Um, it's a little wide and loose longer term, but that comes with the territory of gold. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Uh, not bad. You're coming off a of multi-year lows in here. Oh, look at that. I feel, I feel like tiny Elvis. Oh, I thought it was a weekly. On a four-day chart, you had a four-day bow tie. So I think a major bottom is in the works in this particular stock based on the four-day chart. And you're coming off of pretty major lows in here. You go all the way back to like 2001. So, uh, yeah, Doc, I like that one. Uh, on a pullback, though, you need to, just like a little one-bar pullback, and I think it uh, might be worth a shot. You ever trade a long-short relationships like plug and F-cell? Well, I, no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do pairs trading. Is that what you're asking? What, uh, what 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 is plug and F? Why would you pl trade those two? Oh, you're trading the stronger one in a sector, the shorting the weaker one. No, yeah, you know that got popular a while back. And there's plug and that's F C E L. That pairs trading thing. Um, and everybody was hot and uh, let's just say excited to to keep it PG thirteen about this pairs trading. And that's where you short one stock and you buy another. Um, I think it's a bad idea. Um, it was working a while back, so everybody jumped all over it. 
And then I haven't heard much about it since. To me, it's too many moving parts. And to me, you limit your gains. If you do it right, I don't know. Just It's just too many moving parts. Um, pick the one you like the best and trade it. Okay? Don't try to be smart. It's like you're trying to outsmart the market. I'm going to sell this stock, but I'm going to buy this one. I'm going to short this one and buy this one. You know, it's like, well, you, you, you must be pretty good if you could do that. So I'd avoid, I'd avoid pairs trading. I think it's a bad idea. But, hey, it's not my way or the highway. Now, what I have found is these certain types of methodologies, and my methodology too for that matter, but certain types of methodologies will dovetail in or fit perfectly in certain markets. And people will start trading them, and they'll like, they're like, oh, I don't know why I didn't do this my whole life. And they'll have a very brilliant year, okay, or six months or three months or two months, whatever the case may be. And then things unravel a little bit, and it stops working, okay. So that's the danger if you're going to go out and try to pairs trade or something. I, I think it's a bad idea, but if you, if you want to do it, spend 20 years of your life studying it, and make sure you know the nuances of it and know how it works. Because people will rip me a new one on, on my methodology. But let me tell you, when it works, there's nothing better. And when it's not working, you can keep your head slightly above water. Okay, You don't implode and you end up flat. You might sit out a July like we just did and not do anything. Right? Hard for many to do. But longer term, if you could live through these cycles and do it, you'll do just fine. Okay? Yeah, Jonathan, uh, just a bad idea. I would avoid that at all uh, cost. Might as well do side by side BLDB and plug. Might well, might as well. Well, you could put you could put ballot in here if you wanted to. BLDP, and then we could put plug in there. Um, show you what I'm gonna do here. Or you know, you could. In Metastock, you can create composite securities. Parents and symbol, plug. Okay. All right, so let's close them down. All right, so you've got, we've got Ballard in, in the foreground, and we got plug in the background, okay? So, well, let's say you're short the blue one, and you're long the yellow one. Well, the yellow one's going up. Yay! I'm making money. Well, the blue one's going up too. Ah, uh, I'm losing money. You know, making money, losing money, making money, losing money. It's like, why? Why would you torment yourself and pairs trade? Okay. All right, Steve had to go. We can talk about Steve now. S B O T F. I don't know what that is. S B O T F. S spot. I don't know what that is. R short. That is the pirates, one of the pirates' favorite stocks. As a possible short. Ah! Sounds like I should say, ah, caramba! <laughs> um, it's got a little gap in here. Not too bad. I think it's okay. Uh, I think you could certainly do worse. How's that? A little bit on the thin side. Kind of a big cap stock, but on a thin side. I guess everybody's heard of Ryder. A big, well known. Okay, well, like I talk about Go Go Nomo, uh, this would fit the bill in some aspects of that. Although I would like to see a more impressive run in the run, but I'm gonna give you a not bad on that. Okay, okay, Richard, that was my point. Uh, it's been so long. What, what was your point? Whether Paris trading is worth it or not? Yeah, I'm hopefully that. I, I just don't like. It's just you know too many moving parts. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. That's the point. It's too many moving parts. It's like, geez, you got to get two things right. And you know, it's one of those things where I was trying to explain to my daughter last night. I forget exactly what we're talking about, but I was trying to because she had she had, she she's got that wondering mind, kind of like me. She's got I don't know if it's a sickness or a, or something that's great, but you, as you can tell, talk fast, eat fast, always you know just the way I am. And I'm always wondering about things, and she's she's got it like times ten. And she was asking me last night about something, and I tried to explain to her. And I think she got it that in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, 
they're not. And that pairs trading is, oh, that's beautiful. Well, you just you buy one and then sell the other one, and then the one you sell goes down, and the one you buy goes up. And it just sounds, uh, it sounds wonderful. Sounds like I'm coming out of the closet of more than Fibonacci, huh? <laughs> Rick for Howard. There's a little joke. Uh, yeah, maybe on a pullback, but it's had a pretty good run. I mean, that thing just kind of took off out of nowhere. Yeah, on a pullback, but maybe a deep pullback, okay? Uh, Kang for when? Kang, K-A-N-G, okay. Um, this one I've been kind of looking at, kind of noodling with a little bit. The only thing I don't like about it, I would prefer the breakout from this base to be a little bit bigger, with IPOs, though, sometimes you can be a little bit more lenient, okay? But ideally, I was looking at this one this morning. I actually would like to see the breakout look like that and like that. Then I'd be all over it. But this breakout's a little bit smaller, but I think it's worth I think it's worth keeping on your radar, okay? I'm not sure I want to jump out and buy it, but I think, I think it looks good. PFNX, did we go through that one? PFNX, we'll start wrapping things up in a minute. Um, I have a position in the stock. Uh, I know it's thin, and breaks some rules and all. So, this is the best looking stock I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> uh, on a pullback, maybe, yeah. Especially if it continues higher. Uh, but yeah, this is the the buy at B thing. Uh, the aforementioned buy at B thing I talked about earlier. So yeah, you're on to something there. Uh, really, really, really thin though. So I've got a little tiny position. So I really can't. But full disclosure, I do have a position there. Um, but yeah, absolutely. No, it's not a knockout um, because a knockout is uh, with the trend. A knockout is against the trend, but you have a trend. A knockout is you got a nice little trend, and then all of a sudden, a bam! You get a big move down like this, and then you look to get long above that high. Remember CLDX, the example that I've used a thousand times this year, was a fantastic example. Of that, in fact, let's see if it's in here. Oops, we lost something. Uh, notice right here, you had this knockout move. Notice you got a, an established trend and an ideally an accelerating trend, and this is a knockout move. This actually was. Um, hang on one second, my headphones acting up. That was actually in, uh, in in Traders Magazine. If you don't read Traders Magazine, you should. It's free, and uh, I've got a series of articles. That have been coming out in that um, in that magazine, www.traders.com, I think. Anyway, uh, not to digress, but uh, that is not a. Um, no, this is this is a. Um, it's Traders Dash Mag. This is stocks and commodities. Stocks and commodities is pretty good too. Um, this is my buddy Lutor over in uh, Lotor over in. Um, in Germany, um, it is originally in German, but you have to translate it to. Um, just tell it that you want the English version. Traders-mag.com, and then click on EN for English. And then I'm actually, uh, I think I'm in the last three issues, and will be in like the next five or six. Okay. QLD, that's going to be an inverse thing. Be careful with the inverse things because you have one heck of a tracking error. QLD. Um, yeah, I mean, you could. This is an ultra. Um, it is getting a tiny bit of that gatekeeper look to it, which, again, I normally don't measure these things, but let's just measure it for S&Gs. Yeah, it's actually a little bit more than a gatekeeper. Well, close enough. So, yeah, it looks like a gatekeeper. It looks like a possible short. Uh, avoid these leverage shares, though. Not enough time to get into that, but uh, just avoid those. So, and finally, last one: AGTC. AGTC. Did we cover that yet? Yeah, we covered that one. Okay. Uh, looks like we're out of time. Uh, I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you taking time and the business schedule to be here. Like I always say, I tend to learn something too. So, from selfish standpoints, I'm getting a lot out of them. I know it sounds kind of egotistical, but um, I do get a lot of these shows, and I do enjoy them, as you can tell. Any unanswered questions, you know the routine, david.davelander.com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. 
If there's anything unanswered, shoot me an email, David, Dave, Landry.com. Thank you so much, and again, enjoy your weekend.